looks like people are asking in now. So I guess I'll get like the intros going. We can introduce everybody and we can get started. So uh, basically this is our second mile to marathon kind of women's issue talk. So today's all gonna be all about kind of return to run after pregnancy as well as like training as you're getting older and approaching that perimenopause, menopause age. Um, our last talk was actually more training around your menstrual cycle and nutrition for around your menstrual cycle. So if you guys want to check that out, it is up on the YouTube channel, I believe, the Miles Marathon YouTube channel. Uh, great talk, lots of info, probably take some notes on that one. Uh, but today's more going to be about kind of those phases where women's bodies are really changing. Um, so I haven't actually introduced myself. Uh, I'm Lauren Prufer. I'm technically Dr. Lauren Prufer. I'm an MD. I'm also a coach and strength trainer with Miles Marathon. I'm kind of emceeing or guiding the talk, and we have a whole bunch of great panelists on today, a bunch of experts in various areas of training and running and women's health. Um, so I'll have everyone kind of go around and introduce themselves so people can kind of see their faces and put the faces to the name. Uh, let's start maybe with Karen. Um, do, you want, do you want to take a second to introduce, introduce yourself, Karen? Sure. Yeah, my name is Karen Tyson, and I'm a physiotherapist. I do uh, orthopedic physio as well as pelvic health. And um, I've been a longtime runner, run a number of marathons, ran in university for Western. And uh, yeah, so just excited to be part of the talk. My kids are probably going to be screaming <laughs> in the background. <laughs> I'll try and manage that. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to speaking to everyone and answering their questions. Yeah, Karen, you really got that uh, lived kind of running as well as, as having the two sons experience going. Mm -hmm. All right. And then also helping us out with kind of the return to run after giving birth is going to be Catherine. Want to introduce yourself, Hi. Catherine? Yeah. So um, I'm a master's athlete. So my kids are a little bit older now. So I have a um, 14 and a 17 year old. And I'm also a coach with Miles Marathon. So um, yeah, I guess I got into running later in life. So I kind of I was running as a recreational runner and got competitive um, after I had my kids. So my return to running was an interesting story as well. So, yeah. Great. And um, we've also got Gina Grain. So Gina Grain is a strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, she's out in Vancouver. She's also a past Olympian, professional road and track cyclist. Um, I'll let you take away the rest of your introduction, Gina. <laughs> oh, awesome. You, you took, took half my words out of my mouth there, so thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so all that. And then um, uh, I'm a mom. Um, I have a four-year-old son. And uh, I've actually taken up running um, uh, after, after cycling. Yeah, so, um, but it's a weird situation because my knees, I've had ACL surgeries in both my knees. My cartilages are um, kind of shot. But um, I, I developed a program when I was uh, camping that um, helped to kind of... Uh, activate the right muscles and it actually uh, worked and so now I'm uh, up to 10k running and um, I did my first uh, triathlon this actually I did triathlons before my career but I re-entered a triathlon this year after my cycling uh, career and I did it uh, by myself in my uh, garage because it was canceled but I did it anyway <laughs> so, anyways yeah I did the triathlon by myself um, anyway so um, yeah that's a bit about me I have my master's in um, exercise science I took that after my uh, cycling career um, uh, while I was pregnant, and um, now I'm working primarily with uh, cyclists and triathletes and runners in Vancouver, um, but I've been to the Olympics with a couple of athletes um, for alpine skiing and Paralympic, pa Paralympic uh, skiing, and so um, and the majority of my work revolves around endurance athletes, um, but I do do other uh, sports as well. Cool. That's all really great. <laughs> And then last but not least, we have Paula. Uh, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself, Paula? You may have lost Paula. She disappeared. Well, <laughs> Paula is another one of our mile to marathon coaches. Uh, she held the record for the marathon um, for the over, over 50 age group um, for a while. 
and she's a general speedy lady, also a master's athlete. Um, I know she came to running a little bit later than average, but she's really passionate about it. So it'll be great to hear about her training and how that's progressed. Okay, so those are our speakers. I guess we'll kind of get started on the first half of the talk. Um, so basically, audience, uh, we have a Q&A button, so feel free to jump in and ask questions. I'll be asking everyone questions, but if you think of anything, if you have anything comes to mind, just let us know and we'll get that addressed. Um, my first question was for Karen, and I was hoping that you could kind of explain to us a bit about how women's bodies change after giving birth. For sure. So, um, you know, in my profession, we, we really take a look in the postpartum period at the pelvic floor. So, you know, we have all the, the, the more obvious changes um, during pregnancy where, you know, the, obviously the belly expands and the organs shift inside the pelvis. I've brought some nifty models for us. Okay. Um, and, and so the biggest change in the postpartum period it is really um, in the pelvic floor. So the muscles uh, that support the organs inside the pelvis. And obviously, you know, the pelvis is going to widen in order for uh, delivery. And that really forces the muscles in the pelvic floor to work through a larger surface area because you've got a wider pelvis. There's often trauma that occurs in the muscles in the pelvic floor. You may have had some varying degree of tearing. You may have just overall a lot of load throughout pregnancy. So we talk a lot about loading our bodies through running, but we don't necessarily think about that type of load through pregnancy, especially if you're also running. Um, you know, the, the other big change is the position of the organs inside the pelvis. So typically, um, you know, you have your bladder, you have your uh, vagina and your uterus, and you have your rectum um, sitting, and then you have the pelvic floor that really supports those organs. And after the um, weight of and period through pregnancy, and delivery, what will happen to the pelvic floor is it can often sink down. And then the organs will often sink down too and sit lower in the pelvis. So you can get um, issues related to that, which can vary widely from things like incontinence, pain with intercourse, or heaviness, pressure, feeling like something is coming outside of the body, uh, like a tampon sort of feeling falling out of the vagina. And those are a lot of the major uh, things that can change. One of the other big changes in the postpartum period is that basically everyone during pregnancy gets an abdominal separation. So we talk about that being a diastasis recti where the fascial system in between that nice pretty line in the abdominals will actually uh, separate because as the abdomen expands and the baby becomes larger inside the belly and the uterus that you have to have that fascial system actually stretch to make space. And then it's really dependent on genetics um, and, uh, and luck, who just has an elastic recoiling perfectly of those muscles, or who really has this ongoing separation. So they don't have good elasticity of the tissue, and that can also be impacted by the hormone changes in the postpartum period, whether it be um, breastfeeding or, or I know you're going to talk a little bit about hormonal changes, Lauren, as well. So um, that abdominal separation can cause lots of issues in the postpartum period. And as it relates to runners, really we're thinking about stabilizing the abdomen. And if we're not able to manage intra-abdominal pressure because we have a gap, so in intra-abdominal pressure can escape, then that may cause changes or pain. It can cause abdominal pain. It can cause low back pain. Now there is some evidence to actually show that an abdominal separation might be protective of prolapse. So if you have an abdominal separation, it's a space where pressure can escape. So instead of pressure pushing down and generating more load um, and giving you that heavy 
pressure or that something falling out feeling, it may, may be protective of that. So there may be some built in things that the body actually does initially that are adaptive in the postpartum period. But if we have, um, you know, a genetic, uh, increase in elasticity or uh, sorry a decrease in elasticity in our fascial system where things don't just bounce back perfectly which they never really do in the postpartum period um you know then we can end up having a maladaption from that where it can cause issues in terms of stability okay um i was actually reading a little bit about diastasis and like apparently 60 percent of them come back together Mm -hmm. on their own um and the interesting thing too is that men can actually get them as well which i didn't know um but i think that's a really good overview and then like so you talked about kind of the pelvic floor essentially falling down um some of those organs being displaced you're maybe getting that like widening in the front of the abdominal wall so it sounds like a whole situation of the core being less stable maybe your posture is affected. Um, how does all that impact running? Yeah, so when we look at running, you know, initially in the postpartum period, and there's a great summary that a number of physios, sort of a combination of orthopedic physios and pelvic health physios that have done to try and amalgamate the research and look at, you know, what really is good research, um, what isn't good research. And so if, if people are interested, it's by Tom Goom, uh, Granier Donnelly and Emma Brockwell and, and it's free you can look it up and have access to it and it's basically a review of all the literature related to women's health and running um, it you know it really focuses on that postpartum period and so you know they look at sort of what functional things that we should look at um, and and how we should progress someone in that postpartum period. So really, as it relates to the runner, you know, you're thinking about can we generate enough strength? Can we make the core nice and stable so that we have a nice foundation to move our limbs off of, right? Because the more proficient we are at stabilizing our center, the more power we can generate from our extremities. And so that's a big one in running. The other big way that it can impact runners is just our ability to actually tolerate the training volume from a symptom perspective. And those symptoms might be leakage. So if you're trying to do a long run and your pelvic floor is quite weak and suddenly you're having incontinence, so you're peeing yourself, you're not gonna be super inclined to be in a big running group where you might be more um, self-conscious about that, right? And you know, a lot of women, even young women will experience leakage related to running and and not tell anyone even teens um, they found can experience some urinary leakage and so this isn't just something that we have to th think about and, and educate women on in the postpartum period or the peri or postmenopausal period when there's also other changes that are going to create more um, incidents of issues if someone hasn't had issues earlier in life um, but you know you might only have issues related to doing speed work or when you get to that fatigue point of your pelvic floor so you might have pain might have pelvic pain pubic pain low back pain sij pain so sacred iliac joint pain related to your training volume so that may really limit you in terms of what you're able to do yeah so you definitely have to kind of like i think a lot of women you know, they have the baby, they're excited to get back to running. And then sometimes, like sometimes it's even a couple of years later, right? And then those roadblocks kind of come up and things just don't quite seem to be the same mm -hmm. as they used to be. Um, but they're actually very, very common problems. Yeah. And you see things like that, even in women doing strength training, um, skipping, double unders, even deadlifting. You can have lots of trouble with leaking uh, during those movements. Mm -hmm. I know, um, so Catherine and Karen, both of you actually have kind of returned to run after going through childbirth. Um, maybe you can talk to this first, Catherine, but what was that like for you? Um, my experiences were really different with both of my kids. So with my first pregnancy, I had a pretty challenging pregnancy. She was posterior. 
Um, so there was a lot of back pressure. Um, I had a very tough delivery. It was a long labor and I had a lot of tearing. So I had quite a bit of damage to my pelvic floor area. Um, when I look back, I wish I had been a lot more patient um, with my return to running. I think I started too soon and I experienced a lot of what Karen's talking about, like trying to go for runs. I was having to stop at a bathroom, you know, like every bathroom down at Jericho, which is probably every like 500 meters, I would have to pee. I just couldn't, I didn't have um, the strength to hold it in. Um, whereas with my second pregnancy, I was very comfortable. I ran through um, pregnancy with number two and uh, had no issues with return to running. I did wait a little longer to start. I probably started running maybe four weeks after as opposed to like, two or three with my first. Um, but what I often say to my people that I'm coaching is everyone's, everyone's experience is very different. And I think Karen's saying that too, like some of it can just be luck of the draw, genetic, um, how your labor is, how your pregnancy is. But I think everyone just needs to be really patient um, and listen to their bodies uh, when, they're, when they're returning to running. Yeah, I think too, like you see like celebrities or elite athletes and a lot of them, they come back so, so fast. And what people don't realize is they have like, they were doing training like before pregnancy to prepare their body. They were doing stuff during pregnancy. And then they have a team behind them after pregnancy who's like supporting them and helping them through that. Like they have a personal trainer and a coach and a pelvic floor therapist who's like, and for the average person, they just don't have that much support. So it's not, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I wish I'd had a pelvic floor specialist because I feel like I gave birth to my first daughter and had this sort of traumatic delivery and was sent home with her, you know, that, that evening. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's basically like sit on an ice pack, right on the rim. And that was kind of the guidance I was given. There was no guidance given on return to exercise, um, getting back into running or it was just see, you know, you're going to see your midwife and your doctor in the next little while and they'll give you some information. But I find a lot of them don't have a great, um, they don't know a lot about women as runners. And so they're, they don't know how to give you that information. So you almost have to be your own advocate for like, I need to see a pelvic floor specialist. Um, I think almost every woman who's given birth should see someone who specializes in that after because I can't think of anyone who hasn't it's traumatic to your to your body it's a big traumatic event and we don't treat it like that after but we should um, with the recovery and seeing people who can really pinpoint us in the right direction yeah I would definitely agree with that having um, one of my friends recently gave birth and just like very athletic girl but just like even walking around with her a couple weeks out from delivery she could barely walk um she had a lot of like kind of ligament laxities like her ankles were gone and her SI joints hurt and her back hurt and her pelvis was way tilted um but yeah really just everyone could benefit from seeing a pelvic floor physio after and just kind of getting things back in line and firing again what about for you Karen what was it like uh coming back to running so you know after during my first pregnancy, I was running a lot. I was, you know, I guess before my, I'll back it up to before my first pregnancy. You know, I think that's when you and I were training together. I, that was back in 2015. You know, I was running probably better than I was even in university, um, running a lot of mileage, running lots of, um, you know, very specific marathon or half marathon related training I was training for the Scotiabank half I think that um that season and uh I ended up starting a master's program um I think Gina said that I decided that being pregnant and doing a master's program at the same time was a really good idea <laughs> if I couldn't run I might as well do a master's program um but you know certainly during my pregnancy I was able to really run quite a lot and I was able to strength train a lot. And I had been doing a lot of high intensity Olympic lifting, CrossFit type activities. And so I was 
very strong and I had a really good foundation, but I also had some trauma. I had a very significant cervical tear. I had, um, which is major internal surgery after I had, you know, a lot of stitching around the cervix. So not exterior and more the superficial muscles, but really internal. And I, I, you know, as much as I know about pelvic floor and being a physio and being you know, doing pelvic floor physio, I, I still don't think I really appreciated that I'd had major surgery. And I know that's pretty common with women that have had cesareans, like they really don't think about how significant that event was. And we don't treat it like that. You go, you see your, your, um, you know, your OB or your midwife six week postpartum, and they're like, okay, you're good to go, you can return to exercise. But when you're talking about someone doing, you know, 100 to 200K a week for some of these high level runners that are doing longer distances, like your OB doesn't get it. They don't know what to tell you related to that. Um, and so, you know, I, I could barely walk a couple days. I think the first day I walked, you know, probably 20 steps. And then I said to my husband, and it probably took me 10 minutes. And then I said, I got to turn around. Right. And, and then the next, you know, later that day I ran, walked twice as far and the next day I walked around the block, but they told me I couldn't do anything for six weeks. And I was like, really? Like nothing. Are you sure about yeah. that? Um, and you know, I think at five weeks instead of six weeks, I kind of happened to know my OB and kind of like, like oh, I'm feeling fine. I think I'll give it a go. And so I did start um, at five weeks with with doing some running and and was able to progress. After my second, um, I I was a high risk pregnancy because of what I had gone through with my first. They weren't sure whether my cervix would hold initially, and so they really they let me run, but I couldn't strength train. And I really noticed huge deficits between the two. Um, just in terms of my ability, like I, I find even postpartum, like you can barely get up off the ground. Yeah. Do a kneel, kneeling position to standing, especially holding even like a little baby, like you can barely get up your whole anterior, um, abdominal system, like all your slings and everything that supports you from a flexion, like pulling forward perspective, there's nothing there. And then all the drivers for running for hip extension and like they're just whittled away. Like you, you know, your baby is sucking all those nutrients out of you and, and um, yeah, the, the muscle just seems to go first. Right. So um, now in my second uh, delivery, I did go back after three weeks postpartum and I had been doing lots of pelvic floor work. And in my first pregnancy, I'd gotten an abdominal binder to use immediately postpartum. Um, but, you know, I think I'm, I'm two and a half years postpartum now. And I, I, I feel like I'm back to almost normal, um, at two and a half years, but, yeah. you know, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think people, I think women don't realize like when you have a cesarean, you re like, you really come out and you have this like, you know, like little scar and it's kind of like, you know, hidden away. Um, but you don't really realize that they've actually gone in, they've like opened up like the rectus abdominis. They've gone through all those like muscles. They've like, they've gone right through all that to get to the uterus to take the baby out. Um, and how much like separation and trauma really occurs through that process. Women, if you have a natural childbirth, you can actually get back to normal activity a lot more quickly, uh, depending obviously on the level of tearing and what goes on with that. But a lot of women after natural childbirth are able to get back a lot more quickly versus after cesarean, it's at like six to eight weeks um, because it is a major surgery. And I don't think that people necessarily always recognize that. Um, there's not a lot of education around that. I think it was interesting, Karen, that you mentioned you did more, I remember you doing a lot of strength training during your first pregnancy and you felt that that made it you know, go better. Um, what would you recommend for women who are thinking about getting pregnant um, in terms of training, preparing their body, um, making sure that they're kind of ready to go and have a healthy pregnancy and bounce back? Well, oh, 
I, I definitely think that weight training is, is important just to, you know, build up your muscle mass as much as you can. And, you know, I know a lot of women are worried, especially if they're runners about doing weight training and getting super bulky, but that's really- I do so much weight training. Can you tell? (laughs) Yeah, me too. Right. So I, I think, you know, in, in, in 2015, I was doing tons of weight training, like, like CrossFit heavy weight training. And I kept getting thinner and thinner and thinner because I was still pairing that with high mileage. Right. So it's, that's a fallacy, but I think that just getting good foundational support through the lumbopelvic area is really essential. You know, don't think of it as like doing lots of crunches and getting like at strong abs, right. You need good foundational support. So you need glute max, you need glute med, you need your quads, hamstrings, all of those really important muscles that help stabilize the lumbopelvic system. You know, even the crossbody slings, like not just the superficial rectus abdominis, which is what everybody thinks of as abs, but you know, the, the lats and, and the glutes and like, those are all part of these slings that support our system, both anteriorly, posteriorly and laterally. And, and that's really what you want good support in. And then the other piece is get an internal pelvic health exam. Go and see a pelvic floor physio who can assess you. There's a lot of runners who are actually tight in their pelvic floor. They don't need Kegel, 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 Kegel before pregnancy or before delivery. They might need to, and you can also have a tight pelvic floor that's weak because it's in a shortened state. So if you're talking about muscle fibers that contract, if my muscle fibers are tight, just like in running, if my hamstring is short, it's not powerful. It can't generate a full eccentric and concentric contraction because I'm already sitting here and the pelvic floor is the same. It's just a muscle, right? You can strengthen it. You can weaken it. It can be, it can be tight. It can be hypertonic, high tone. In other words, it's sensitive to the touch or it's sensitive to things poking at it. Right. So whether, you know, someone has issues in the during intercourse or whatever, like those are all indications that you need an internal assessment. And that's the only way to know whether you're doing a Kegel correctly. And people like, so here's a a kind of comical story. So during my first pregnancy, I was doing my master's of clinical science. So I have a kin degree. I have a master's in physical therapy degree. Now I'm doing a specialization physio degree. I went to see a pelvic physio and she asked me to do a Kegel. And I was like, okay, here you go. And she's like, yeah, that's, you're not doing it right. I'm like, no, like I know how to do a Kegel. And she's like, no, you're bearing down. Like lift it up. I'm like, okay. She's like, no, you're still not doing it right. So it, and it, and I had terrible pelvic floor because I had a tight, weak pelvic floor and the hardest thing was to figure out how to relax it. And then once I could figure out how to relax it, then I could tie in the motor program and actually generate a good amount of strength. But that, you know, that really wasn't achievable in the pregnancy period. You're sort of working to prevent it from getting worse. But by giving someone strengthening exercises and teaching them how to properly relax and recruit their pelvic floor in the immediate postpartum period, before I'm even allowed to see women, I don't typically do an internal exam until six weeks postpartum, they've already spent six weeks knowing exactly what to do. They've got an abdominal binder to optimize closure of the diastasis because as much as we can't you know, as much as a lot of it depends on genetics, if we functionally return that tissue to the position it should be in, in other words, we align it normally, then it functions in its normal alignment. And then it says, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. So abdominal binding, you know, belly zinc has great binders. Um, And we're not talking about waist trainers. We're just talking about something that generates tension that pulls that fascial system back together. But they already have that education. They know, they know, um, 
most of the education around pelvic floor physio, which is probably 90% of what seeing a pelvic floor it, physio is. You can help teach them about hydration and diet. And those are really important to prevent or reduce constipation in the postpartum period or irritants to the bladder. So if you have a weak pelvic floor and you're experiencing leakage and you're taking in lots of caffeine or lots of sugar or lots of fatty foods, then those are irritants to the bladder. So the bladder is angry and it's more likely to be inflamed and you're more likely to have leakage. Um, and then if you're constipated because you're not taking in enough fluids, you might be breastfeeding. Um, and this could be, you know, even a year postpartum, you could be back training at pretty high volumes, but you might still be breastfeeding a little bit. And so this still affects you. Um, and so, you know, those are really important things. If you're constipated, you've got all this extra weight sitting in the pelvis, that's more weight on your pelvic floor. And these organs, they sit so close together, they all impact one another. And so really a lot of it is about this holistic way of how you can take care of your body. Um, you know, just these little tips and tricks that seem so simple, but sometimes you just talk to someone about one thing and it can completely change their symptoms or like a, a lot of um, people bear down when they pee, like to get it over with. And that can be a huge risk factor for, for pressure, prolapse, or tension in the pelvic floor. So you're you're supposed to sit, go to the bathroom, relax, and then your bladder empties. But a lot of people push, um, you know, because they're busy and you got patients you got to get back to or, you know, whatever. You're in the middle of your run and your, your watch is going or your, you know, training partners are waiting for you. So just understanding some really simple things that can have a huge impact on your pelvic floor health. Okay. That's really helpful. So basically... It sounds like to summarize, like before pregnancy, uh, work on that strength training. So think functional core movements, think leg strength, glute strength. So things like squats, deadlifts, farmer's carry, um, get your body ready for the challenge of pregnancy. Maybe see that pelvic floor physio, come up with a plan that's going to include like knowing what a Kegel actually is. Uh, maybe getting a binder and some nutritional strategies for when you're kind of, when you've got the baby at home. I'm sure having all of that planned out is <laughs> key when you are coming home with a newborn. Uh, whether or not you get any of it done is another thing entirely, but <laughs> it's good to have a plan. Um, and then you can kind of see your pelvic health physio in follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think I just had, we'll probably switch topics, but I just had one more question. So I know a lot of women um, I see women kind of like more so with strength training and they're like in their fifties and they still have, um, leaking or they still have diastasis or is it ever too late to kind of go and work on those things? Um, is that something they can still address? Yeah. And that's an excellent question. And I think it all boils, uh, down to it being a muscle, right? So we would never think that, oh, I can't go to the gym and strengthen something, but we lots and lots of women in their 50s, 60s that, you know, their kids are, are teenagers or married and they have kids, right? And they think like, ah, it's too late for me. Um, it, it's never too late, right? You can always strengthen a muscle and retrain it to work properly, right? You know, I've seen women in their 50s and 60s that have leakage, that we've been able to resolve their problem. They have a prolapse and, or, you know, as their hormones start to change in that peri or postmenopausal period, that can be a really key period where they might start to experience pain or heaviness or leakage related to some of those hormone changes as muscles get deconditioned, as the, the tissue in the pelvic floor or the vaginal walls can get thinner. Um, they, they need to be retrained. So yeah, it, it, you know, it really only takes a couple sessions. I see women from, you know, on average to for, for four to maybe nine sessions. And that could be over the course of a year that I might treat them for them to have near 
if not full resolution, near full resolution of their issues. So, and, and the cost can sometimes be a barrier that people will bring up, but you have women that wear incontinence pads for years and it costs a thousand dollars to, to $1,200 a year in incontinence products. And I could see you, you know, four to six times and solve or significantly reduce the issues that you're having. Um, that sounds like a good, and you don't have to wear depends, right? Or avoid activities that you yeah. love because you're like worried about like, you know, leaks and yeah, you can't and, wear certain color clothing and what have you. So yeah, and that's a really big issue I think for women's health in general, right? There's a huge void in education for women where those women that were in their 20s and 30s, you know, 40 years ago, and were having leakage and just stop doing that activity. So now they've got this huge social barrier or physical barrier to participating and having a healthy lifestyle. So now they're, they're going to be, uh, have a higher BMI, which is actually going to increase the risk for things like prolapse or incontinence because you have more weight on the pelvic floor. Um, they're going to be at more risk for other um, health disparities like diabetes, heart disease, other things, all because of incontinence. And I think for me as a physio, you know, I'll, I'll stand on my um, stand and, and, you know, like obviously beat my drum because this is the things that I'm really passionate about, but it's frustrating to me because I think, you know, in the past, a lot of our healthcare was decided by men who didn't know what it was like to be a woman who didn't experience all these issues, right? Like there are tons of treatments for male issues. Um, like they get attention real quick. They get referred to a specialist, you know, related to, issues um, that men have, but women often suffer in silence. Like they, I find it crazy that you, you go through all of this through your pregnancy and you see a doctor in, in increasing frequencies. And then in the postpartum period, you often don't even get not even one internal exam, never. Yeah. You're just like, you're discharged and they see the baby and that's kind of. Yeah, and then it's all about the baby. Nobody cares about the mom, it's all about the baby. Um, you know, and, and you're lucky if you even get a, um, a, a check-in in terms of postpartum depression, right? So, and not necessarily from your healthcare provider, they might ask you, but you only saw them once, right? And you might not have had an issue at that point, because at six weeks, you're probably not running, Right? So a lot of these things initially aren't a problem, but as you start to increase the intensity of your exercise, they'll reveal themselves. Okay. Yeah. And I think those are all kind of good points. Uh, thanks so much, Karen. It's kind of time to switch topics now. Um, if you guys want to learn more about Karen, you can find her at Karen Gilbert Tyson Physio. She does running assessments, pelvic floor physiotherapy, obviously. Uh, you can also follow her on Instagram. She's always posting great strength stuff for pelvic floor and general health. Yeah. So, thanks so much, Karen. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. So switching gears now a little bit more into not so much the opposite end of the spectrum, but just getting into other changes that women go through. So that would mostly be kind of menopause and perimenopause. Um, I figured I'd kick us off with just a couple definitions of menopause common symptoms experienced by women during menopause and obviously reasons to see your doctor. Um, so basically from a medical standpoint, menopause is defined as 12 consecutive months. So 12 months in a row with no period. Um, as you approach menopause, your periods typically become less and less regular. Your cycle can get longer. Your cycle can get shorter. They can get heavier. They can get lighter. Um, and Realistically, symptoms start on average four years before you actually go through menopause. So it might be a little shorter, it might be a little longer. Um, and the average age that menstruation ends for women is 51. So now with lifespans being so long, women are living well past that. Women are competing and racing um, and doing all types of wonderful things well past that. But it's not something that I feel like as coaches or um, athletes even, we really talk about enough or we really address. So it's part of the reason why I thought this would be a great um, topic 
with input from other coaches as well. Um, and then in terms of, I guess, things we see like that would typically affect someone's training uh, with the hormonal changes that happen during menopause. So basically your estrogen, progesterone levels, they'll start to decline. Um, but before that, you do get a little bit of irregularity. So your body doesn't deal well with changes. Um, and because of that, you'll get kind of disturbances in sleep. So insomnia is really common, changes in mood, trouble with memory, your metabolism changes as well. So a lot of women struggle with weight gain. Um, they find their body composition changes. And you, you actually become less tolerant to carbs. And on top of that, your body is a little bit more catabolic. So you actually tend to break down muscle at a greater rate uh, than you would have pre-menopause. Pre so it's a little harder to build that muscle and it's a little harder to kind of hang on to your power output as well. Uh, we'll talk about kind of how to address some of those things. Gina will definitely get into that. Um, and then the other obvious symptoms for women are hot flashes. Uh, women also suffer from decreased heat tolerance. So basically during menopause, you have to be a little bit more careful about your heat exposure and make sure you're staying well hydrated. You can use pre-cooling strategies, even drinking something cold, being in a cold environment uh, before your race or before your workout can be really helpful for that. But it's important to be aware that you are a little bit more susceptible to heat stroke and heat illness. And then the other kind of important thing that impacts runners is changes to bone density. So you can lose up to 20% in the first five to seven years of menopause. And for runners, obviously bone density is very important. We want to avoid stress fractures, bony injuries. Um, so generally to prevent that, you want to take in 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day, ideally through diet, as well as at least 600 IU of vitamin D. So those are kind of my quick menopause overview facts. We'll get into how to troubleshoot some of those a little bit more, or you guys can ask specific questions if you have them in the QA section. Um, but for now, Jean is kind of going to kick us off in terms of talking about what her main focus is for strength and conditioning are with female athletes as they're aging. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. awesome. Okay, great. Um, uh, first of all, that was some awesome information, you guys. I'm just, you, you guys are awesome. I learned a lot today uh, already and um, lots of things uh, hit home uh, for me here today as well. So it's nice to be talking to such great people. Um, uh, so just uh, um, piggybacking off of what you just said, Lauren, um, interestingly, in the, in the past uh, five or so years, I think um, with, with my, my clients um, and other people that have been a approaching me, uh, I guess probably because of the influx of information and the availability of information, people have been wanting to know more about their body composition. And this is a big shift in, in, in kind of when I started training, um, you know, body composition, you know, you're interested, but it was kind of like, eh, don't really want to know, you know, but, but more and more people of different um, uh, ages were coming up to me and saying, hey, you know, I'm kind of interested in my bone density and my muscle mass and all this stuff because uh, these things change, as you just said, um, as we age. And um, uh, I would say the majority of my population that I work with is, you know, uh, 45 plus. Um, let, let's say. And so anyways, to make a long story short, I, I, I researched um, systems because I kept on um, sending people to DEXAs and like, hey, why don't I try to get a system of my own? Um, so anyways, long story short, so I have a system called the uh, Evolt 360. And I just want to share my screen because I, I want to bring you through a little bit of a, um, a, a history of somebody that I've been training. She's a, a woman who is, um, if that's okay, is that okay, Laurel? It's yeah, no. A lot of uh, Lauren, sorry, not Laurel. I uh, learned um, uh, different uh, questions. Um, so I, I kind of followed her, and 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 um, we took her body composition. And she's a uh, she's 62 now, and uh, doing it since she's been 60. Um, she was a, a, a very avid runner. She would run marathons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and ended up uh, having knee issues. So she went to, to the bike, and I met her. I met her at Tag Cycling, um, which I, I founded and, and started uh, that 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 uh, cycling company, um, Tag Cycling, but. Uh, so anyways, so um, I've been working with her in the gym. And so uh, that's a bit of a, a kind of a background. So let me just, I'm just going to um, share my screen here. Um, see, Dylan, it says that um, I've been disabled. Could you enable me at all? 
here with the share screen. Could you know how to do that? Yeah. Host disabled attendee screen sharing. Is it possible, Dylan, for you to change that? Are you there? I don't know if he's I am there. here. I'm okay. not sure. I'm not sure what I need to do to give you that. You can, uh, make, you can make Gina a presenter if you go over to the participants. Yep. You keep participants. Okay. Gina less, Gina more. Um, I've got make host. Change role to attendee. Um, not sure which of those I should do. If you make her a host, then okay. she can screen share. Okay. Okay, I think we are. Uh, okay. How about now? You good? Yep, I think we're good. Woo! Okay, you guys, uh, you guys got that? Yep. Okay, great. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statistics, but I just wanted to, well, can you guys see the, my screen here? Yeah. Okay, so this is a woman that I find it very interesting. Like we, we looked at her lean body mass. Can you see my, my cursor? So, so look over towards the one, two, and three, and four column and five, five column. That's, that's pretty much what I'm going to focus on here. So her lean body mass was towards the, 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 the kind of lower end of where, where the, 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 the ranges for her are in the brackets. Can you guys see that? Okay, so her lean body mass was towards the lower end. Her skeletal muscle mass was towards the lower end. Um, her protein uh, content uh, kind of right now, smack dab in the middle, meaning her, her, her nutrition was really good. And uh, her, her bone mineral, um, I, I can't say density, but it's her, her bone mineral, which, relate, which relates to bone density, um, is towards the lower end. So we looked at these, these, these metrics. Um, I'm not gonna go over the, 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 the fat, is irrelevant. Um, um, so we, we looked at these, these metrics here, um, and then we put her on a, on a, on a strength training program. Um, so with, I, I do a lot of, a lot of the stuff I focus on is I, I do like, I do like numbers and I, I like testing and I like, um, uh, assessing because that gives us uh, goals uh, to work towards and you can also track, track people. Um, so for her, we worked together for a, a number of years, two, two, uh, two, two years. So if you can see here in November 2018, all the way through to January 28th. Um, but without getting too involved in the numbers, um, uh, basically within 20, November 28th to January, so that's uh, December is two months, um, we tested her leg strength endurance, uh, which improved by 8%, 24%. Um, her upper body and core improved by 33%. But here's what I want to also take a look at is her jump height uh, and, and, and power. And those, th those two are, are, are measures of um, your, your, what we call simplistically your fast twitch muscle fibers. And, and, and with, with aging, um, perimenopause, menopause, and, 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 and further, we start, to, we start to lose those fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, why do we need those as endurance athletes? Well, we can say we don't need them at all, but actually we do need them. Um, we need them for a number of reasons. Number one, health-wise, we want to be able to react quickly to catch falls and 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 to be to to, to remain strong. Um, another reason we want to maintain those is because in 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 effect, it will improve your uh, running economy by uh, being able to um, uh, produce power um, in a long and short of it, uh, way without going too far into it. It improves it improves your running economy. Um, so anyhow, so going over to to, to the graph here you can see you can see um uh here we have uh november the blue uh january is uh the red so you can see improvements in in, in everything that she did um and then uh, a, a pretty big improvement in april so we went through a number of training but then then there was a time where she um she stopped training in the gym and uh due, due to life etc cetera, etc cetera. so we, we brought her back in and you can see the purple all the purples uh, declined 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 her 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 um leg strength endurance or her um her, uh, sorry, her left and right leg strength endurance, her core and push-ups, and her uh, counter movement jump height. Okay, so again, looking at power, look onto the next graph here. The blue is uh, counter movement jump, which is your springiness, and your um, uh, standing jump, which is more uh, strength related, okay? Um, so the blue, she increased, 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 and then decreased. And uh, again, this, the, the standing jump, she increased, increased uh, small, that was about 100 watts and then increased a lot and then, and then decreased. 
Um, moving on, the last thing I want to show is um, something called um, muscle tendon stiffness, which is um, uh, it's called your eccentric utilization ratio, which is your ability to use your fast twitch muscle fibers essentially and so um this is important for, this is very important for running because you want to be able to use the muscle tendon um uh system e efficiently um and there's ways to train that uh, in in the gym so basically anything under one um you're wanting to work more on plyometrics and and that's that stiffness in order to uh, be a more economic runner um uh, anything more than one, you're looking good. So you're looking at one, 1.1, 1 1.2, that's, that's a great number. So, so for her, she was a runner, so she had a pretty, not a bad R e EUR of, uh, of one. Now these are very small numbers, it's, it's, it's just a ratio. But you can see how with a, with, with, with um, 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 a, a lack in training, her eccentric utilization ratio dropped uh, quite, quite a bit, which was really some fascinating um, um, uh, um, um, uh, stats uh, uh, on that. So I'm just going to stop the share. Actually, I, don't, I guess I don't need to stop the share um, at the moment. So uh, I, I just wanted to show you, sh show you that as 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 a kind of a life a life um, stream or life uh, line of of how um, strength training can help um, somebody of this age. And, and at the top there it says, yeah, she was 62 year old, fit, healthy. Um, uh, she um, got second place in the Whistler Fondo in her age category, and she qualified for the World Championships that year uh, as well. Um, I just put it at the very top here because she she is a how do I say um, she the last thing she wanted to do was go into the gym. Let me put it that way. <laughs> and so she wrote me this quote afterwards. She goes, "I was skeptical. I never knew what strength training uh, in the gym could do for me. My aerobic fitness on the bike has improved and my body feels better and now I can ski now uh, with no back pain at the end of the day. So this brings me to uh, just another point. It's like, okay, you know, we're, we're athletes, we're runners or triathletes or cyclists or whatever, but we also like to do other things. And so that's another thing that strength training can do for us as we age is because we start to lose those fast twitch muscle fibers, that ability to be strong, that's the first thing we lose. We can run all day, we can bike all day. Our, 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 our um, slow twitch muscle fibers last us um, a lifetime, but what we need to improve is those things that are declining. And, and, and that's, that's the fast twitch muscle fibers, which is gonna help with all aspects of life. Yeah, and I think that's true of all runners, not just you know women who are approaching menopause um, or getting kind of, a bit older there I think it was interesting though you showed like she's still making significant gains right like she's still gaining strength she's still gaining across those different measurement standards you had um, as long as she's training and then when she stops training she goes down um, yeah. and like what kind of training were you doing with her because most I think the most endurance athletes were told like high reps low weight is that what you were doing with her <laughs> No, no, good question, Lauren. Um, I don't know if this is the correct uh, program. So, so th this is this is this is this is an example of of, of one of the programs that um, that I work with. So, you, you'll you'll see this is one of, of her programs. Um, you, you'll you'll see that the the, rep, the repetition scheme is tens, um, tens, and then it goes down to by week four, you're looking at eight eight repetitions. It changes to. And then we actually get down to a six repetition range, and then we get down to a, do we do a four? This is a, this was a ten week program for her, uh, and then and then a five uh, a, a five repetition. So the repetition schemes I use are are, 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 are as you see, and and I always um my my programs are pairs that I always include an element of uh, mobility. Um, basically, within every within every circuit, I include a mobility. Um, uh, uh, exercise, just sliding it in there. Because if you ask somebody to stretch or do mobility exercises, that's probably one of the, uh, the, the last things on your, on your mind to do. So including it within the workout, that is your rest, is your mobility. And essentially, you can go over one of my workouts for, for, for an endurance athlete. They don't want to be in the gym. They want to be running. So I have them in and out um, in 45 minutes to an hour once you learn the program. Um, and and um, yeah. Um, I think that's about it uh, on that one. <laughs> I think question. like the interesting thing there is like as you like as you scroll down, you'll notice it kind of goes from like higher reps to like lower reps. Mm -hmm. And when you're getting into the lower reps, you're obviously lifting higher weights, yeah. um, and that's when you start really seeing a lot of those gains in power. 
Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, 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 all the research out there right now is, is, is you want to lift heavier, you want to lift lower, lower. If, when you're ready, you know, you're not going to go into the gym and, into the gym and start uh, lifting like a 4RM or something, right? But, but the, the, the research is you're, you're lifting four to six to eight repetitions, three sets is usually, will usually do it at, 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 at the load. And ideally you want to be working on the concentric phase um, with control. So the eccentric phase with the control and then the concentric phase, which is the uh, more the up phase, I guess, of a squat um, with the wisdom speed is kind of a, a, an overall umbrella explanation of that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, starting kind of more building that strength and then don't be afraid to lift the heavy weights, especially for women. Um, and especially as you're getting old, but really for all runners, it's a great kind of thing to be doing. Yeah. And it's the fallacy, as, as you were mentioning, it's, it's, it's a complete fallacy that you're going to uh, uh, get huge lifting heavy weights because I've been, um, kind of doing a mini study on my own in the last, uh, five years with, with endurance athletes and putting them through a, a similar program that you just saw. And, and, and we take the pre-weight and the post-weight with, with Donna, with Donna, I don't, sorry, I don't have her, um, post, post-weight on here, but she didn't. She didn't gain a pound, um, and there's other uh, athletes that didn't gain a pound, except if they say, "Well, over Christmas, I kind of need a lot of <laughs> uh, yeah. a lot of." Uh, it wasn't it wasn't due to the weight training program. They said basically, so so no. Depending on how you structure your your weight training program, you will not you will not gain mass. And and I think as as uh, Karen uh, Karen was saying that uh, the interference effect with um, strength training and endurance training is is is, is massive. So. Uh, you, you know, if you're doing strength and endurance training within six hours of each other or so, the interference effect is going to combat the, um, the rate of muscle um, um, building. Yeah, plus you're female, uh, so you're, you know, less predisposed to kind of pack on all that muscle. Um, and as well, like if you're, if you're actually doing like a bulking program, you're doing a lot more volume than you see there too. Yeah, kind of. well, yes. yeah that bulking, you're eating for bulking. You're making an effort yeah. to do that. <laughs> You're not like. And, and the, the big thing with, 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 now. with the big thing with with how how I structure um, strength training for for endurance athletes is really working as as I said a, a lot on a lot on movement patterns that are different because we work in in in, in such a linear linear motion uh, that I like to do side to side work. Uh, I like to do a lot of again as I said a lot of mobility and one of the one one of the, a big thing that I focus on with um, with my athletes is um, movement um, quality. Okay, so somebody comes in after a season of, of racing or a season of, of, of even, even pre and post training, and uh, we need to assess their movement quality. If you, if you can't if you can't move properly, then how, how are you gonna how are you gonna squat or how are you gonna do this that or the other things? So movement quality, especially as we age, I'm even talking for myself because I see changes uh, as well um, as I'm not uh, training as much anymore. Um, so uh, you know, movement quality is definitely a number a number one uh, priority for me in 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 my my training. You know, with within our, I mean, I, I don't expect people to put their uh, foot behind their head, um, but there is a certain standard that I like to see people um, uh, do uh, before they start a training program as well. Um, yeah, for sure. Move safe. <laughs> don't get injured. <laughs> yeah, I use I use um well for for myself I use a uh, kind of movement uh, movement quality home assessment, and you can do this on your own. Uh, you go through a number of um, uh, uh, it's based on uh, a number of, uh, I've made this, but it's based on a number of, it's based on the FMS, it's based on some NSCA stuff, it's based on my experience, um, uh, a bunch of stuff you can do at home, uh, just scoring yourself a yes or a no. And then there's a uh, the exercise video library that gives you, um, based on what you scored a no on, uh, it gives you your, your training, basically your prehab exercises. But I use a lot of this a lot of my athletes, some of my older athletes, um, uh, to basically say, hey, because they say to me, hey, what do, I do, what do I need to do for prehab? Should I roll? Should I stretch? I'm like, well, let's find out. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to get you doing stuff for half an hour. Like, if you don't need to do a calf stretch, don't do a calf stretch, <laughs> uh, right? Um, so we find out specifically what, what, what they need uh, for their prehab exercises, for before their run, for before their swims, or whatever have you. And they might have just uh, maybe, maybe they're lacking in a single leg rotation. So um, single leg rotation that will bring them to uh, the YouTube playlist. And um, that'll show them at some point the, uh, the, the exercises to do. This is, uh, so this would be their prehab exercises type thing. Cool. It's uh, pretty, pretty, pretty simple, yeah. So we actually have an audience question uh, from Gwen. So she's asking, would you say that strength training and running in particular can reduce or lessen the effects of perimenopause or menopause? Uh, is there any scientific evidence of that? Um, so I'd say like as to the scientific evidence, there's definitely evidence that kind of that healthy lifestyle. So that's 
good nutrition, getting good sleep as much as you can, as well as um, exercising can definitely help to lessen symptoms. Uh, Paul and I were actually talking about that. I was wondering, Paul, if you would talk about a bit about your experience um, with training and exercise and how you think that's impacted menopause for you. I think she's, I think Paula's still there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Paula. Sure. I was having some technical difficulties earlier, so um, good. I'm glad you can hear me. Um, I think that, um, you know, and I'm still learning. I'm learning every month, you know, different things with this whole menopause because um, obviously I'm right in the heat of things. So um, I think that strength training is probably going to be one of the most important factors, especially, um, you know, you start hitting that 45 and over range. That's where I seem to notice the biggest decline. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be big, but I think with the strength training, it becomes almost just as important as the running and the training on your body for sure. Yeah, just in terms of feeling better and still being able to run and do all those things you love and just like feel healthy. Yeah, like like just to maintain, just to maintain that, you know, whether it's a healthy weight, whether it's, you know, that strength so you can still push through those workouts or those runs, it's it, the strength training is very important. Yeah, and the recovery especially. Yeah. What about for uh, for you, Catherine, how have you found trainings changed as you age or things have been different? Yeah, I would really agree with what Paula said. So I'm 48 now and I would say around 45, I started to notice quite a shift in my ability to recover. So um, I used to be able to do three hard sessions a week and that wasn't a problem up until about 45. And at 45, there was this shift where I just felt a lot tireder. Um, I definitely started to enter perimenopause. My cycles switched around. Um, I'm three years into it now and I'm at the point where like I might go five or six months without a period. Um, I'm having sleep difficulties, which also impacts your recovery. So the inability to get a good night's sleep because I'm waking up with either a hot flash or I can't fall asleep or um, so a lot of that, I would also agree that the strength training has been a huge part and it's not the part that I love. I love to run. Um, but just doing it twice a week, um, I've been working with my physio and my kinesio, they work together. And what they do is they set up a program for me where I go into the gym, they film what I'm doing and then I can take it home with me. So then I can go to the gym on my own time. Um, so it's a little cheaper and I don't have to see someone every time I'm going in. Uh, I found that's really helped for me. Um, the other thing I found is shifting some of my nutrition. So like you were saying about the carbs, mm -hmm. um, being less carb dependent and increasing my protein. So I'm making sure that as soon as I finish a workout or strength session or even an easy run, the first thing I do now when I walk in the door is... Um, have between 20 and 40 grams of protein. I think Stacy Sims is kind of advocating for closer to 40, which I don't know. I've heard mixed things on that, if that's um, too much or not. So I've tended to go kind of like 25, 30 grams um, within that sort of 30 minute window, have a shower and then have another meal with protein in it. Um, and also making sure that I'm getting protein in every meal that I'm eating. Um, so I think just that's been a, a focus for me that maybe I didn't have to be as careful of or I wasn't really paying as much attention to before I hit perimenopause. Um, the good news is, like, as, I mean, Paula and I are still running well. Um, it's just, you just have to be on top of things a lot more than you used to be. <laughs> I can't, the gone are the days where I put on my shoes run out the door, have a run, come back, shower, and go do something else. Like, it's a, it's a process now. Um, but if I want to keep running, I know that that's part of it. Yeah, well, I'm only 30, and I feel like I can't just head out the door for a run yeah. either. So <laughs> those days are maybe long gone. Um, yeah, I think the note about the increased protein um, is definitely a good one. Like I was mentioning, 
um, as you age, as the estrogen and progesterone are coming down, you're you kind of are more susceptible to that muscle breakdown. So the idea behind that is you're just kind of trying to discourage that. A lot of women will do like BCAs pre-workout, um, especially for longer sessions, because that's going to help to, it's supposed to help to maintain your muscle and prevent your body from burning that muscle during, say, your endurance activity. And then fueling up with protein after um, is very important. In terms of your mileage and stuff like that, how has that changed, Catherine, or has that changed? Um, it hasn't a lot. I mean, my focus has been the marathon for the last um, probably like four or five years. So my mileage has been pretty high. Um, I just don't do doubles in a day. So a lot of marathoners who are kind of doing a, at a higher level will do two runs a day to get their mileage up. Um, I don't do that because I need the full recovery. And I've also switched to, um, instead of doing my mileage over a seven day cycle, I do it over more like a 12 to 14 day cycle so that I always have two days where I can recover. So the recovery might still look like it's a longer run, but it's done at a much slower, easier pace. Um, so it's really just been working with my coach. I think communication with your coach is key when you're going through this and um, just discussing like, I'm really tired today. Like, I don't think it's a good day to do this workout and, sh and being okay with shifting that. Um, flexibility goes a long way during this period, I think. Um, yeah, for sure. back up. Yeah, I think like some of my athletes, um, they still run six days a week. I have a couple athletes who do a bit more cross training and it really, like they do biking or swimming um, and it really just depends on the athlete and what their recovery is like. And also I think like you have to think of like life stress and what's, what else is going on in your life because your body kind of perceives all that stress as the same thing. So it's kind of managing that stress and recovery cycles and understanding that those are going to change throughout your life and yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I went through a very high stress period last year um, and I was training for a marathon and I got injured and it was, it was, I firstly it was the other life stress as opposed to the actual training, but I just wasn't able to recover. Um, so I often talk a lot with my athletes about that. Like it's training the whole person. Um, people forget especially a lot of us who are type a um we look at the run as getting out there and that's our like recovery you know or our stress release or whatever we want to call it and sometimes it's actually doing the opposite and you need to just pull back and maybe that means you just go for half an hour instead of an hour or you know you you just take it really easy or you go for a walk instead some days but it's just um really listening to what's going on in your life and your body. And it just, it's important at every age, but I think as we get older, we have to really, really listen to those signals that our body's sending us. Yeah, you're less tolerant of your kind of uh, old, terribly pig-headed ways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to break those habits though. Yeah. I still catch myself often as I'm heading out the door knowing I'm tired and that probably I should pull back and it's really hard for me when it's on paper that this is what I'm supposed to do to actually change, like to recognize that the smart decision is to change that. So I understand for other athletes, like it's the same thing, right? If a coach gives you something, you want to do it and you want to, you want to do it well. So just remembering that sometimes doing it well is to not do it that day. Yeah. Your coach doesn't like have your body and doesn't know how you feel. So yeah. it's kind of a communication, like, process more than like this is what you're doing and yes so that's how it should be ideally <laughs> yes ideally <laughs> great um so i guess basically to sum that up like the strength trainings helped um doing all those recovery cool down and warm-up activities being really on top of recovery and listening to your body maybe cross training if you need to um all really important as you age um, and then I guess in my other question for you, Catherine, and you, Paula, was, uh, fueling, like, during your runs. I, I think a lot in, um, that Roar book, 
she, ta she talks about, for instance, women during menopause not being able to tolerate uh, sugars as much on the run or particularly fructose. Uh, fructose is not well tolerated by a lot of people. It's taken up by the liver, doesn't necessarily go to the muscles, um, but women in menopause seem to react particularly badly to fructose in terms of their blood sugar levels. Um, that's fruit sugar, also found in honey, high fructose corn syrup, which you should avoid anyways. Um, how has your nutrition changed on the run? Um, I've switched to Morton. I found that that's what's worked for me is um, a Morton drink. I find the gels are okay, but I find the drink is a lot yeah. better for me, which isn't great because you then have to find somewhere either to stash your bottle or carry it with you or hopefully someone's with you to give it to you. Um, but I, before that, I've always had kind of a sensitive GI system, but it's definitely been more sensitive since hitting perimenopause. Um, so I have to be a lot more careful about what I eat before I go for a run or what I eat the night before. And then, yeah, the fueling during, I found Morton's really the one that seems to be the least um, aggressive on my stomach and maybe a slower release of energy. But I do think it's kind of a personal preference as to what works and just trying it out. Kind of experimenting with your nutrition. Yeah. Be your own, I say like N of one but you're your own kind of unique experiment. Um, I've actually been taking the pandemic uh, as a time to experiment with my nutrition. So I'm like, well, if I'm in the bushes, off in the bushes during my run, yeah. it doesn't matter. There's no races coming up. So it's not a big deal. What about for you, Paula? Has there been any changes to your nutrition, your fueling strategy during runs, anything like that? Well, to be honest, like, you know, we talked about this before. Everyone's different, right? Everybody's, you know, an individual. I really haven't changed much with my nutrition like and I'm also not a marathon runner so my nutrition is important but not quite as important as it would be for Catherine with all the miles and, you know the endurance um, so I still take gels I still you know none's kind of my drink of choice but I've never really like I haven't changed anything my stomach's still fine um, so I've been really fortunate right like kind of yeah I've always had a really strong stomach so I've never really had those gut issues going through but again everyone's different and and any of my athletes I will say the same like you you have to experiment with different things because we're all we're all different yeah exactly like I generally I have a couple athletes typically female who have sensitive stomachs and I have a sensitive stomach and it's just you have to try things out until you find something that works for you and just because it works for your favorite elite or whoever it doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for you so yeah 100 percent yeah okay so um i think that kind of i think we're a little bit over time here already so if anyone has any quick fire questions that they want to type in uh go for it now i think gina you also talked about um sharing your mobility assessment mobility self-assessment resource uh, with our athletes? Is there a way they can access that or find that online? Hi guys, can you, can you, hear, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, so I, I, uh, I'll just uh, share my screen again here. I think I already um, touched, I just uh, touched on that uh here so this is a movement quality uh home assessment um th that I've, I've already i've already talked about and i would i would be more than happy to um to uh share this uh with 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 whoever whoever wants it um uh it uh i i i do offer it for for, for sale but i'll um definitely offer this uh, for, for you guys whoever is uh, on the call here today that you can go through these these uh, this this assessment um, and uh, and see how how you um how you span out. If you guys are interested in taking this, I'll be more than happy to uh, share the assessment with you for sure. Okay, and they can just reach out to you on Facebook or. Yeah, uh, probably just uh, yeah, my email will be uh, will be best. Yeah, yeah. for for now. All right. Yeah. Oh, I think we do have a, I think we do have a question. So. Uh, we have, do the panelists recommend any resources, refueling that perimenopausal women can access to learn more? Nutrition is one area where people are subjected to a huge area of conflicting information, often not evidence-based. Um, 
So yeah, again, uh, like, like I think Catherine and I mentioned, the book Roar um, by Tracy Sims. She also has uh, a couple of videos on YouTube. She has a Facebook page where she like posts um, nutrition tidbits, tidbits and facts. That's a great resource, uh, a great place to start. She has a lot of information about fueling for women in general, but she has a whole section in her book on menopause and perimenopause. Um, and if you're in, in, if you're in Ottawa, you can borrow my copy. It's like highlighted and fact checked. So <laughs> that will be interesting for you. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great resource. Uh, do any of the other panelists have other resources around nutrition for women? Obviously consulting a registered dietitian um, can be a good idea. They're science-based. Um, they'll typically give kind of good quality information, especially if they're a sports dietitian. So you want someone who can address your nutritional needs based on sport because sports nutrition is very different from uh, typical nutrition. Basically you take typical nutrition and almost turn it over a little bit in some ways for sports nutrition. So I think those are the two I'd recommend. Does anyone else have any others? Okay, and we have another question. Oh, <laughs> all right. So I, I think that, oh. For Gina, if you don't mind. Sorry? I have a question for Gina, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. So I was listening to a podcast that Ryan Hall, uh, the American Olympic marathon runner, um, did, and, and he was talking about, he's now powerlifting since he's retired from marathon running. And so he was talking about through powerlifting with his athletes that he's training, that he does not have his athletes actually go into full depth squats. And I just wondered what your opinion on that for running runners specifically is. And whether that's something that you typically avoid or you don't avoid. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, um, Karen. Um, you know, full depth squats is, is squats is it, it's a hot topic, uh, and 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 everybody will have a different opinion on that one. My standpoint on full depth squats is: can the person do it? First of all, <laughs> if if you, if you can't do it, then um, th then you shouldn't be even going there. Um, full depth squats, um, contrary to what a lot of people uh, think, it, it it is actually okay for your knees. However, for endurance athletes, um, most people can't achieve that because of tightness in their hips. Um, so I, I, to, 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 to answer the question, it depends on if the person can do it. I, I don't encourage full depth squats a lot um, because I don't think that you really necessarily need that. Um, I, I, I won't, if somebody really wants to go there and they can, then I'll, I'll, I'll okay it. Um, but no, I, I'm not, people do not have to reach a full depth squat on my program. In fact, I, I know very few that actually can. <laughs> so did, did that answer your question a bit? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think, you know, certainly from a CrossFit world, um, a lot of what they do, I know, you know, certainly when, if I'm doing lots of mileage and then I try and do like snatch, like I can't do a snatch. It doesn't pair with running. Like you, you go for a run, you try and do a snatch. You absolutely can. Like it might take you an hour or two to even get into the available range. Just, yeah. you know, and obviously through running, those are not available ranges that you require as a runner. I think from a physio perspective, obviously I'm thinking more like not loaded or very lightly loaded just even for for joint lubrication and nutrition to get through end range and and for functional okay. mobility so yeah i totally i the sumo squats like a deep sumo squat for mobility i almost include in everybody's warm-up you know to to the extent that they can but yeah totally karen i totally am on the same page as you with that yeah i mean most people just can't get into it yeah yeah thank you cool thanks all right well thanks guys that was really great um and thanks for all the questions from our viewers so we will be posting this on the Miles Marathon YouTube channel. So if you guys want to share, um, like, comment, you can follow us even if you want. Basically become a YouTuber over here. Um, thank you to all the panelists for sharing their knowledge with us and participating in our talk. And I hope you all really enjoy your evening. All right, thanks guys. Thank you.
Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.